The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Okay, so it's a bit past 4 p.m. in Rady, London. Um, good morning or good afternoon or good evening and a very warm welcome to all of you to our virtual Q&A hosted by Nature Nano Technology. I'm Christine. I'm an editor on the team of Nature Nano. And um, we are very excited to have people and more and more people joining really from all over the world, which I think is quite amazing in these rather difficult times where we sometimes feel a bit disconnected from our peers. Um, I'm especially excited to have two leading nanotechnology researchers with us today, Nicole Steinmetz and Ronit Sachi-Panaro. Thank you so much for taking the time out of your very busy schedule, I'm sure, to discuss um, your work with us today and uh, participate in this, in this discussion. So Nicole and Ronit are both currently focusing their research efforts on developing a vaccine against COVID-19, which we're all uh, very desperately, I guess, um, waiting for. And there are currently, um, I think, about 12 vaccines, different vaccines in clinical trials, different stages. And um, one, quite excitingly, one of the very first ones that entered clinical trials is actually an mRNA vaccine that is delivered by a lipid nanoparticle. And I think that already highlights the potential very important contribution of our community, of our field, nanotechnology, to the development of a vaccine and uh, to the development maybe also of a therapeutic intervention and COVID-19 research um, in general. So um, today we want to discuss about um, our contribution to the field, about uh, the work of Nicole and Ronit, and um, we thought we're going to start off with both of them giving a like 10, 12 minutes, rather short uh, introduction to their work. And this is then followed by a uh, Q&A session. So you guys are all muted, um, but please do use the questions tab in your menu, as some of you have done already to then ask questions after the talks. And we will try to get to as many of them as we can. And we try to wrap this up in about an hour. We'll see how that works. So I think I talked enough. So I want to introduce um, our first speaker, uh, Ronit Sachi Fainara. Uh, Ronit is a full professor at Tel Aviv University, where she's head of the Cancer Research and Nanomedicine Laboratory and also of the 3D Bioprinting Initiative. And she also holds the Kurt and Herman Lyon Chair in Nanoscience and Nanotechnologies. She was also recently appointed to be the next director of uh, the Tel Aviv University Cancer Biology Research Center. And her research is, re is really very multidisciplinary. So she integrates biology, chemistry, medicine, bioinformatics, and nanotechnology to really develop a uh, 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 platforms to selectively guide drugs to specific pathological sites, with always the aim to eventually get this into the clinic. She has published more than 120 papers. She has received many, many awards, and um, we're very glad to have her here today. So, Ronit, the stage is yours. Hopefully, everything works. I'm going to mute myself, and uh, very welcome. Thank you, Christine and Fabio. This is a great opportunity for, for me and my group to, to share a little bit of the roller coaster that we went through in the last uh, three months, uh, of course, globally, but also uh, in the lab. In uh, I will share my screen. I hope this is working. Okay. Um, so usually in normal days, we work on, on cancer, nanotechnology, immunotherapy, and 3D printing of uh, cancer models to mimic the clinical setup. And lately, we, we have published about six months ago uh, our work on a cancer vaccine for melanoma using nanotechnology and nano platform that has a peptide in it. And while all this, as I said, roller coaster of the COVID-19 started, we thought, wow, maybe this could work also against infectious diseases and especially to SARS-CoV-2. So we were not sure about it in the beginning, and the more and more we understand about the, the mechanism of action, mechanism of infection, and, and the way it works, we are still far away from understanding everything. But what we could figure out is that we could use all the tools that we developed for cancer immunotherapy to, uh, de to develop a COVID-19 vaccine. So a little bit of background to, to see where, where we are at the moment. So 
In, on March 12th, uh, the WHO has declared uh, COVID-19 as a public health emergency of international concern, basically defining it as a, a pandemic. And if we look at the numbers today, about 213 countries reported COVID-19 cases. There are about 8.2 million cases uh, that were confirmed. Today, there are three and a half million active cases where unfortunately, almost half a million, 444,000 succumbed to the disease. There are no treatments or vaccines approved against COVID-19, although there are, quite from the beginning, some uh, emergency use approvals by the FDA, like uh, plasma from convalescent uh, patients, which worked uh, very well on, first published in, in March on five critically ill patients, but this cannot be a routine uh, therapy for, uh, for, and it doesn't fit at every stage of the disease. The other two are remdesivir and hydroxychloroquine sulfate or the chloroquine phosphate, which was actually revoked on June, two days ago, on June 15. So we are left more or less with remdesivir, but every day we get new data about, for example, yesterday with the dexamethasone, uh, a corticosteroid and some other uh, drugs that are repurposed drugs that are being tested, and I will reflect a little bit on that later. So what we are left with is what we can all do is physical distancing. I don't like a social distancing uh, the idea, but physical distancing and masks for the remaining population, while worldwide mandatory quarantine measures were infected on COVID-19 infected individuals. If we look at the SARS-CoV-2 structure, we see we all recognize those spiky proteins here. These are the spiked lipoprotein. There is the membrane protein, which is on the membrane, obviously, the envelope and the nucleocapsid, which is intracellular. And these are the four uh, structural proteins where most of the immune-mediated vaccines were developed against. So if we want to understand uh, where we can interfere, whether it is with a vaccine or a, uh, with the repurposed drugs, we have to understand the entry and mechanism of action of SARS-CoV-2, which is quite similar to the rest of the coronaviruses. What we see here is that uh, the SARS-CoV-2 can bind to the ACE2 receptor that is uh, present, expressed on uh, lung epithelial cells, but also on other uh, cells in the brain, in the, um, in the uh, intestine, and on, in the heart, in, on cardiomyocytes as well. So this leads also to the other effect that we see beside the, the respiratory effects associated with the SARS-CoV-2. But this is only one mechanism of, of entry by binding and then receptor-mediated endocytosis. Their other options are with alpha proteins like the TM, PMR, SS2 protein, or just fusion with the membrane. And while passing through these uh, intracellular vesicles that we know that uh, requires a reduction in the pH, then we see the release of viral genome that while using the ribosome of the host cell, our cells, the lung epithelial cells, for example, it translates to polypeptide chains that then need to be chopped and by proteolytic uh, uh, enzymes such as uh, catepsin B and L. And together with uh, the RNAs formed by the RNA polymerase, you see that they are packaged together and then exocytosed from the cell where we see the virion release. Uh, as a whole, we can see that in every step of the way, we can interfere with drugs that are either newly developed or drugs that are being repurposed now uh, for to stop uh, each step. For example, the chloroquine and you know, hydroxychloroquine is to block the reduction in the pH in those vesicles that's not, not allowing the intracellular entry via the endosomes, uh, endosomes. And uh, another one is to block, like with the lopinavir, ritonavir, block the catepsins or other proteases that chop the polypeptide chains that are formed to the, uh, those uh, proteins that are necessary for the formation of the virions. Others are like remdesivir, 
inhibit the RNA, interfere with the RNA polymerase uh, activity, and so on. So we can see that we can uh, interfere with every step here. Uh, but, and this uh, comes out as actually at the moment, there are 2,172 clinical trials. This is unprecedented for something to come up so quickly, so fast in, in terms of the uh, coming from either if it is repurposed drugs, but also newly formed uh, platforms and, and approaches that were diverted to and tested now in clinical trials. So out of those, as Christine mentioned, there are many, some of our, uh, the repurposed drug, as I mentioned, the immunomodulator approaches, which are about 180 clinical trials. Altogether, there are about 75 trials uh, dealing with vaccines, but many of them are with the BCG, the Bacillus salmate uh, green uh, the, for uh, tuberculosis that we know uh, that they are tested to prevent uh, COVID-19 and it induces a uh, non-specific cellular and numeral immunity uh, responses that have been shown to be critical to deal with uh, the SARS-CoV-2 infection. So what is so uh, special about the way that we are all uh, trying to develop these vaccines we can see many uh, and what contributed to the rapid way that we managed to advance is that there is about 85 percent homology between SARS-CoV, the SARS-CoV-1 as we call it, and SARS-CoV-2 that can be by bioinformatic tools and knowing that already we have the 3D structure of the spike protein and the nucleocapsid, the, the intracellular protein that I mentioned, so two out of the four uh, structural proteins, and on top of that, also the open reading frame nine, the ORF nine, were already are already available uh, 3D structures, and together with the bioinformatics from those epitopes, like T cell and B cell epitopes, that were shown to have antigenic activity for the SARS-CoV, meaning that in a T cell assay we saw that they managed to activate uh, T cells or B cells to form later antibodies. This can be selected and then used as a whole protein, meaning either by DNA or RNA or translating directly and uh, having the whole protein administered or peptides that are selected from those sequences that are known to be antigenic or immunogenic. So where nanotechnology enters here and, and the reason is that whether we want to deal with uh, DNA as gene therapy to express in advance any of those proteins that I mentioned. Most of the efforts up to date are uh, this, uh, on the spike protein, but also some efforts are on the other ones. Um, either if we want to deliver oligonucleotides such as DNA, the plasmid DNA, or the mRNA as mentioned uh, uh, before by Christine, uh, as done by Moderna, BioNTech, for the DNAs with the Canzino and some other companies, also uh, peptides directly, we need to, uh, to protect them. So in this case, we need to protect them from degradation in, in the blood. We need to protect them from RNAs, DNAs, and so on. So we use the nanoparticles for packaging them. And at the same time, in many of the cases, we want to deliver them together with other components that will activate the immune system, such as different adjuvants that are TLR activators, whether they are uh, TLR7, TLR9, TLR3, TLR4, any of those were shown to be very important in the fight against COVID-19. On top of that, there are the virus-like particles, and I assume uh, uh, Nicole will talk more about it, together with the polymeric nanoparticles that I will talk about them. So how do we expect it to work? If we are uh, taking any of those uh, nanoparticles that then trap any of the oligonucleotides, DNA, RNA, or, or even the, the whole protein or the peptides that are already processed, we expect them to internalize into the dendritic cells once they are uh, entering the either injected subcutaneously, intravenously, or by oral delivery or uh, nasal delivery. In the case of the nasal delivery, there is also the advantage of uh, uh, creating uh, IgA antibodies against the antigen of interest. So whichever route of administration we choose, 
there are dendritic cells that come to the site, internalize the nanoparticle, process the, uh, the entity. So if it is DNA or RNA, they need to be expressed, translated to a protein, then uh, chopped and processed to the peptides. And those peptides, whether they are MHC1 or MHC2, they are presented on the membrane of the dendritic cell while it is maturing on its route, migrating to the lymph node. And while in the lymph node, when we have already this MHC1 complex to the relevant peptides or MHC2 complex with the relevant uh, peptide of any of those uh, proteins, as I mentioned, mainly spike, but also the others, we see the binding via the uh, T cell receptor, the TCR, of CD8 T cells to the MHC1 complex or CD4 cells to the CD4 T cells to the MHC2 complex. Then we see the induction of T helper, the priming of T helper cells, which activate the B cells. And then the B cells can uh, secrete antibodies that are specific to the uh, antigen or to the protein that we internalize in the nanoparticle. Those antibodies, whether they are IgG, IgA, or even and other subtypes, they can bind directly to the protein on, for example, for, to the spike presented uh, uh, on the SARS-CoV-2 virus. And while doing so, it can either neutralize, meaning that it, uh, the spike in its RBD, the receptor binding domain, will not be able to bind to the ACE2 receptor on our epithelial cells that are prone to be infected by the SARS-CoV-2, or by a different mechanism that we have, which is the ADCC, where NK cells bind to the FC receptor of the antibodies that are binding the, the spike, for example, here. And then we get a granzyme B perforins that destroy the virus directly or either cyt other cytokines such as interferon gamma. This is considered, the antibodies are considered the humoral response, while we saw that in the uh, SARS-CoV-2 especially, uh, we get uh, the other arm of cellular response is equally uh, important, where we get the CD8 T cells, the activated T cells that were expanded, they bind to the MHC1 complex presented on the infected epithelial cells, for example, in the lung, and then we, we see that we get the release of and secretion of granzyme B, perforins, and other cytokines like interferon gamma, TNF alpha, interleukin 2, and others that cause the destruction and lyse those cells that are infected. So, this is the mechanism where we see the nanoparticles being involved in delivering those uh, vaccines, meaning any of the oligonucleotides, proteins, or, or peptides together with the different adjuvants or oligonucleotides such as siRNA or of different uh, immune checkpoint modulators. Then at that stage, we need to uh, characterize the immune response that is related to anti-SARS-CoV-2 effect. And the way to, to do it is first we collect the uh, splenocytes from the spleen and also the immune cells from the lymph nodes following immunization of the mice. These are first of healthy mice. We know that there is no uh, model uh, mouse, mouse model for SARS-CoV-2. So these are first on healthy mice. And then with the check by fax, we can determine whether we got a IgM response, IgG, and, and whether the dendritic cells and uh, the T cells were activated. We can also check for B cells expression and expansion and so on. So this is the first stage to know that our vaccine uh, worked. Then the second one is to collect blood and to do a, to run an ELISA first uh, to test if there are where IgM uh, antibodies raised as the, in the first two weeks, and then later we want them to go down and and. They have an increase in secretion of IgG, and if we manage to deliver it to, through the mucosa, we expect, like for nasal administration, we expect to get also IgA. I think most of the labs working on, on these uh, approaches manage to reach this, uh, this stage, but uh, the next stage is the more challenging one where we need to look at virus neutralization. For this, we need 
a BSL3, uh, BSL3 uh, laboratory, BSL3 la uh, hood, and we see if we manage to neutralize, meaning that either we test it in, uh, uh, with the, the free virus and see if we block the, the, the spike, for example, or the other way is to co-culture them or vero 2 cells that, uh, or epithelial cells that express the ACE2 and to see if we manage to uh, block their entry so they are not able to infect those cells or to bind to the ACE2 receptor. But this is relevant only if we use our antigen was either spike or the RBD, the receptor binding domain. For any of the other areas, if it's peptides or any of the other proteins, obviously it's a different mechanism. And last but not least, we have some potential mouse models that will need crossing, looking at transgenic HLA or humanized ACE2 and PBMC and grafted in red mice and so on, but this takes much longer time. So as, as we said, there are a lot of uh, companies involved that uh, reached already clinical trial, and most of them uh, are in Novio dealing with uh, the platform from the, the DNA uh, plasmids for the spike, or Moderna with mRNA to express the spike protein, uh, Migal protein expression vector, which forms and secretes a chimeric soluble protein that delivers the viral antigen into mucosal tissues, and uh, Canzino with a, a non-replicating uh, viral vector and, and some others like CureVac and, and all the rest that you can see here. So the approaches are, are really diverse and even the route of administration is diverse. And uh, I will tell you in the last couple of minutes the way we are approaching it in, in my lab. And our plot platform is based on a nanoparticle that is around 170 to 200 nanometers in size made of a polymeric matrix, uh, entrapping inside several peptides, MHC1 and MHC2, that have the B cell and T cell epitopes together with a, 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 an adjuvant and a targeting ligand like a MANOS that targets the, the MANOS receptor, the CD206 on the dendritic cell. We form it using emulsification, either by microfluidics or propsonicator, we evaporate, wash, and, and lyophilize at the end, so this can be transported uh, by a, no, no, for a cold chain. So we started with cancer for a cancer vaccine, and you can see that it's the same mechanism that I mentioned before, inducing the humoral and the cellular response, this time against an antigen that is expressed in the tumor cells. And uh, while doing so, we developed uh, such a platform using a MART1, a melanoma antigen, and we could see that we managed to, uh, to inhibit tumor growth and prolong uh, the survival of mice that were vaccinated, whether it was prophylactic, but also therapeutic as an intervention setting, not only as preventive settings, which gives us some hope that also with the COVID-19, it can be used not only as a prophylactic vaccine, but also therapeutic. We also managed to change the, the antigens from the MART1, MHC1, and 2 to neoantigens and a different delivery uh, uh, routes to subcutaneous, either with uh, um, microneedles or, uh, uh, in, or uh, by intranasal as uh, nasal droplets. We managed to reach not only uh, the melanoma in the, on the skin, but also in metastatic sites, including in the brain, as, uh, melanoma brain metastasis. And we can see that in every uh, uh, scenario, we managed to inhibit significantly the tumor growth uh, while comparing with other immune checkpoint modulators. What was interesting for us was that we managed also to induce not only the IgG, IgG2A and IgG1, but we saw that the T follicular helper were increased and the T follicular regulatory were decreased. So this is uh, really important for uh, producing highly selective uh, antibodies uh, on top of the other routine antibodies that we set, uh, set for. This is more for the vulnerable uh, populations that are unable to produce a, a high quantity of, uh, of antibodies. 
And uh, last but not least, I will show you some of the results that we got. We have already uh, vaccinated almost 500 mice with different combinations of different adjuvants and different uh, peptides from the different proteins. And I'll show you just some to, to understand how it goes, uh, following the, the uh, pipeline that I mentioned before. We look at activation of dendritic cells and B cells in cervical lymph nodes. We look at the activated CD8 and CD4 T cells in the spleen. Also activation of B cells in spleen and induction of memory immunity against those uh, structural proteins. And also by ELISA, we could see that the secretion of IgM and later of IgG, that if we use peptides that are relevant to the receptor binding domain, the RBD, this is only one of the peptides that we use, we could see the emergence of those antibodies. So this work is, is possible, in my view, only uh, having a multidisciplinary team from biology, medicine, engineering, and chemistry. Um, I won't even mention name because so many are working on this project. We just converted the whole lab to a COVID-19 lab but we still keep using exactly the same platforms that you use for cancer. This is in collaboration with the, the excellent uh, lab of Elena Florindo from the University of Lisbon with Joao Cognema, Rita Curcio and Barbara Carrera. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Ronit, for this uh, great talk and for talking us through your first uh, preclinical, quite promising data, actually. Um, we do have a few questions, but I think we're going to do Nicole's talk first, and then we're going to go through all of them together. So um, let me uh, get you set up, Nicole. So you should uh, be able to share the slide while while you do that. I will I will introduce you. So Nicole um, is a professor of nano engineering at the University of California, San Diego. And she's also the founding director of the Center for Nanoimmunoengineering. And Nicole's research is really focused on the engineering of plant virus-based uh, nanomaterials for drug delivery, for imaging, and importantly, for next generation vaccines and immunotherapies. Nicole has also authored uh, more than 150 papers. Uh, she's also a standing member of the NIH nanotechnology study section, and she has received many, many awards, and very recently also an NSF grant for her COVID-19 research, uh, which is going to introduce also a little bit today. So uh, thank you so much, Nicole, for joining us. And please do get started. Yeah. Yeah. Can, can you see my slides? Yes. OK, perfect. Yeah, well, uh, hello, everybody. Um, good morning, good afternoon, good evening. Um, yeah, first of all, I'd like to thank uh, Christine and Fabio for the invitation and opportunity to share some of our research here today. Um, so as Christine said, uh, we are focused on engineering plant viruses as a platform technology um, to targeting both uh, human and plant health applications. So all the research we do starts out with plants that we use um, as bioreactors to produce our nanotechnology, which is derived from from plant viruses. So now toward a COVID-19 vaccine, um, there are several challenges. And the challenges are principally the vaccine design itself. Uh, we have to choose an antigen, an adjuvant, and the delivery system. And Rooney made an excellent introduction um, to this topic. There's many different delivery systems that we could choose from. There's different types of antigens, uh, B cell, T cell antigens, subunit, um, antigens, uh, peptides, full-length proteins, and there's various adjuvants we can choose from. But with COVID-19 in particular, we're facing a global pandemic. So towards a successful vaccine, we need to think beyond um, just vaccine efficacy and safety. We also need to think about its manufacture and importantly, global distribution. So we need something that's massively scalable and that can be shipped and distributed throughout the world. And to meet these requirements, uh, we need something that can break the cold chain requirements because these would present logistical as well as, as, well as fiscal barriers um, for the resource poor areas of the world. Now, plant viruses is the technology we turn towards because they can meet this bill. They're easy to manufacture and uh, they don't need cold chain, the cold chain in order to distribute 
So we have a nanotechnology that can be massively scaled and has the potential to be globally distributed. The particular um, platform that I will introduce today is the Cowpea mosaic virus. Um, you see a structure here. This is a 30 nanometer sized uh, icosahedral plant virus, non-enveloped plant virus carrying an RNA genome. Now, when I look at this, I don't see a virus. All I really see is a tool, a platform technology that we can engineer to impart new functionalities targeting human health applications. And um, in my lab, we focus on uh, various applications, uh, cancer, cardiovascular disease, as well as infectious disease. And over the last three months, the focus has really been COVID-19. So why the cowpea mosaic virus? Well, the first of the technology is scalable. Uh, we can manufacture these materials through relatively simple methods using molecular farming and plants. And I will explain molecular farming in, in the next couple of slides in a bit more detail. We have a stable platform. So plant viruses evolved to survive in uh, harsh environmental con con, um, conditions and various environments. Um, they evolved to be extremely stable. So they tolerate wide pH ranges, wide a range of temperatures. Um, they do not require cold chain. Um, earlier, we also learned about antigens and adjuvants. In order to build an effective vaccine, you need an adjuvant, something that can stimulate the immune system. Um, the beauty of our system is the plant virus-based platform is both. It's an antigen delivery platform, but it's also an adjuvant. Um, even though these are plant viruses, so they're non-infectious towards mammals and humans, they're highly visible to the immune system. And I will show you in the next couple of slides the potency um, of these materials as an, as an adjuvant. And like any other nanotechnology, we have a highly modular system. So it's plug and play. We can easily adapt it and change it as new strains of viruses emerge. Um, I, I start out by showing you this data, uh, which is from a CPMV-based cancer, uh, CPMV cancer immunotherapy. And I wanted to show this here today to demonstrate the potency of, of the plant virus-based adjuvant. So in these applications, we're using the plant virus as an NC2 vaccine. So this means the adjuvant is a CPMV, that's our immune stimulatory molecule, and that's being injected directly into an identified tumor. So here we're not delivering an antigen, but rather we're making use of the antigens presented within the tumor of the patient. So the patient itself presents the antigen, and all we do is deliver an adjuvant. Um, after delivery of this adjuvant, in this case CPMV, what happens is we see a remodeling of the tumor microenvironment. The CPMV essentially is a danger signal. So it will recruit innate immune cells, remodel the tumor microenvironment, which if it's successful will lead to systemic tumor immunity. So even though we are just injecting one tumor, uh, we're treating not just this tumor, but rather we're inducing systemic anti-tumor immunity, meaning we're also targeting distant metastatic sites. We're protecting from outgrowth of recurrence of the disease, um, so protecting the patient from relapse. And this goes back uh, to a paper that we published in Nature Nanotechnology in 2016, where for the first time we demonstrated the potency of this approach. Um, so here you see data, survival data, uh, from tumor mouse models, uh, metastatic breast cancer, as well as ovarian cancer. Towards translation, we have now moved this into the treatment of canine patients. Um, you see one of our patients here, so this is uh, somebody's uh, dog, her name is uh, Paige. Uh, she came in with a five centimeter large oral melanoma. And this tumor was treated by a combination of radiation and the CPMV. Uh, radiation was added because radiation is the standard of care and we didn't want to withhold standard of care. Um, what we see here after the two-week treatment schedule, we already see reduction in tumor burden. And after six months uh, post-treatment, there's no tumor, no signs of metastatic disease. We've treated around 10 animals, all, res um, all responded well to the treatment with no apparent side effects, and they all responded. We, all, we saw efficacy in all of these patients. So the point that I want to make here is CPMV is a highly potent adjuvant. It activates innate immune cells, and it does so by, by presenting danger signals and activating multiple toll-like receptors. So therefore, CPMV is not just a delivery platform, but it acts as an adjuvant itself. Um, 
the, so we've chose the plant virus-based technology because of these attributes. Um, they offer safety, um, they're non-infectious towards mammals, yet they're highly visible to the immune system. In a way, you can think of a plant virus as a naturally occurring nanoparticle, a prefabricated nanoparticle presented to us by nature. We have a high precision nanomaterial. So from a quality control and insurance point of view, each particle essentially is a clone of each other. So in, in terms of um, reproducibility, it can't really get any better. Um, so we have a monodispersed material, we have a highly uniform material, and the material is scalable, programmable, and stable. So if we set up around 30 plants that will give us a Ziploc bag, like a medium-sized Ziploc bag, with 100 grams of leaves, we can store these leaves indefinitely at minus 80 and purify whenever needed. Um, an undergraduate student, a high, high school student, could easily do the purification within a day or two days. That would yield about 100 milligrams of plant virus. With that amount, we could treat about 100 dogs. So this technology truly is, is, is scalable um, with, with, with not much technology involved. Um, we can design and um, tailor these nanomaterials through chemical biology for, uh, for the different applications. And we have a stable platform. Um, so with regards to temperature, in, uh, in solution, the materials are stable up to 60 degrees Celsius. In the dry state, they can tolerate up to 95 degrees C. Um, so for a biologic, that's an extremely high uh, temperature stability. A few more words about molecular farming. Um, plant molecular farming approaches offer scalability. So compared to fermentation-based techniques, where you start on the lab scale and you then scale up, everything changes, volumes changes, um, the concentration changes, the process has to change. That's not the case when you use plant molecular farming. The process remains the same. Each plant is a bioreactor. So the more plants you grow, the more product is made. Um, plant molecular farming offers relatively low manufacturing costs. So using relatively non-sophisticated infrastructure, I like to joke we make nanotechnology from dirt and sunlight. Um, but yeah, all you need is uh, to, to set up some plants um, to, to produce um, plant viruses as well as um, enzymes, um, VLPs, mammalian VLPs, and so on. Um, plant molecular farming offers safety. So there's an inability of human pathogens to replicate in plant cells. And I want to give a shout out to some of the colleagues in the field. Um, several entities have already announced COVID-19 responses. Um, I think earlier mentioned uh, was already KBP and iBio, who are developing vaccines, uh, VLP-based vaccines for COVID-19. They're both based in the US, uh, Medicago, um, also responding uh, with a COVID-19 vaccine candidate. They're based in Canada. And then in South Africa, Cape Biofarm, um, Cape Biofarms, who are producing um, also VLP uh, vaccines and um, recombinant proteins, as well as reagents uh, for testing. And um, yeah, just to, to highlight the opportunity of, uh, of molecular farming in um, low-income countries, um, the government in South Africa has uh, invested in setting up plant molecular farming um, to, to respond to pandemics, to respond to epidemics. So here's our approach towards this CPMV-based uh, COVID-19 vaccine. And uh, yeah, to, to start with, I want to thank uh, the NSF um, who is supporting our research efforts. We were recently awarded an NSF rapid grant from the CMMI program, the Advanced uh, Manufacturing and Nanomanufacturing. So we are very grateful and excited um, that we can move this research forward now efficiently. Um, so our approach is we produce the CPMV display technology in uh, plants. Uh, currently, we use uh, black-eyed peas, as shown here. And uh, we, we identify candidate epitopes, um, essentially uh, immunogenic peptides, through uh, the literature or bioinformatics and immunological data that are available. And Runit had already commented um, on, the, on the peptides, so we can choose either B or T cell epitopes. Um, we use uh, bio um, chemistry in order to append these immunogenic peptides onto the surface of the particle. Again, this is a highly modular technique, so if uh, new strains of mutants emerge, we can quickly adapt the technology as needed. 
A few more words um, about the, the technology attributes. Uh, you see the structure here of the cowpea mosaic virus. Uh, a single particle is uh, 30 nanometer in size. It consists of 60 copies of an asymmetric unit uh, that contains a small and a large protein. Um, so these CPME nanoparticles, 30 nanometer in size, offer 300 addressable surface lysines. And um, that, that's, uh, that's the side chains we're currently targeting to conjugate these um, immunogenic peptides. So we use a straightforward protocol where we make use of a bivalent heterobifunctional linker, um, SMPEG, which has an NHS uh, handle on one hand, so this succinamide reacts with the lysine group, and then on the other hand we have a malaimide group that can then react with the cysteine terminated peptide. So it's really a plug and play technology, and again, not just a display technology, but also an adjuvant. So we started this research um, about a month ago, and here's uh, just some very preliminary but exciting data. Um, so, so far we've made four different candidate vaccines. Um, so the CPMV appended with different peptides derived from the S protein from uh, SARS-CoV-2. Um, we, we fabricated those materials, scaled them up, and vaccinated mice. In this case, we're using healthy bulb C mice. And within two weeks um, after vaccination, we already see high antibody titers for, uh, for all four, four candidates against the S protein. Now, the ultimate question is, and Ronit also addressed this, is not whether we make antibodies, but what kind of antibodies are we making? Are these antibodies truly neutralizing? And that's what's, uh, what started this week in our lab. So we, we just sent the materials over to the um, BSL-3 facility to test uh, whether the antibodies, the sera um, from these mice have a neutralizing effect on, on the virus. Um, obviously, this is early stage data. We are just looking at sera from two weeks after immunization. Uh, we are currently doing a longitudinal study to investigate whether boosts are required and how long-lasting the immunity is. Um, also, we're looking at different routes of administration. So, uh, subcutaneous injection, oral administration. Um, plant viruses are extremely stable. Uh, they are orally bioavailable and maintain stability in the uh, gastric conditions. So, we may have an opportunity for an oral vaccine. And we are developing implants and microneedle patches. So I'll go to the next slide. The, the idea to make an implant or a microneedle patch again goes back to this being a global pandemic. And to really make an impact, we need something that can be distributed and applied worldwide. So the advantage of making a microneedle patch is that it can be self-administered. So you have something that does not require the cold chain, you can ship it globally, um, ship it to people's homes so they don't have to go and see a doctor, um, and they can self-administer it. Further, we're integrating a slow-release technology, so this would avoid the need of repeated dosing. So um, a single administration would be effective to, um, to raise uh, neutralizing antibodies. And in specific, uh, in the specifics, how we are generating these microneedles is through hot melt uh, processing injection molding tools, which are massively scalable. Um, so this, I want to point out my collaborator here, uh, John Pokorski, also at UCSD. So we've teamed up um, uh, with his technology that nan advanced nano manufacturing, marrying with the uh, married with the plant virus nanotechnology. Um, so here we are in the dry state. Um, using hot melt extrusion to essentially form a plastic and then mold this into a microneedle. This is done at 95 degrees C. So the plant virus offers this kind of stability. Uh, many other vaccines, many other biologics would not maintain structural integrity at these conditions. However, we have a unique uh, platform with the plant virus being so stable. So this is my last slide. Uh, where I can't show you yet how the microneedle works with the COVID-19 vaccine candidates, but I wanted to show you an implant with an HPV vaccine candidate um, that, that we recently developed to show, um, to show that this technology indeed works. Um, so here we made a VLP uh, that was modified with HPV epitopes, uh, so peptide epitopes using the same techniques that I just elaborated for the COVID-19 vaccine design. These VLPs uh, in the dry state were then mixed with PLGA, 
hot melt extruded to form an implantable composite. And you can see from the mouse study that these are slow release implants. So in, in, in about a month and the vaccine is released. And from the, um, from the ELISA data, you can see that we're generating antibodies with the implant after single administration that match the antibody titers that we get from the prime boost administration schedule using the soluble VLPs. Um, maybe one more point to make uh, in yellow is the peptide um, alone. So the peptide and an implant, no VLP, and we essentially see no antibody titers. So this shows that the peptide itself is not a good vaccine. Um, peptides are not good immunogens. They need to be delivered to the antigen presenting cells and nanoparticles can do this. And they also require an adjuvant and our VLP technology also fits that bill. So the implant mimics the prime boost vaccination. We also confirmed in this case that the antibodies formed are indeed neutralizing. And uh, yeah, this is work that's currently in review and hopefully will be published soon. Um, yeah, with this, I'd like to thank um, everybody in my lab um, working on all, all sorts of projects and currently uh, focusing their efforts on COVID-19. Um, but the uh, UCSD just uh, reopened the, the labs at the uh, lower capacity and saying everybody is happy to be back in, in the lab. So yeah, I'd like to thank um, everybody in my lab, our collaborators, um, in particular relating to the COVID-19 work, John Pokorski, uh, Chip Shuley and Aaron Carlin. Uh, Ro Robert and Aaron are currently um, working in the BSL-3 facilities, so we have our fingers crossed to see some good data from there. And then our funding sources, uh, especially thanking the NSF um, for the support uh, through CMMI for the COVID-19 work. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you so much, Nicole. That was a fantastic talk. Very, very exciting work and exciting that the labs are slowly opening um again around the world good to hear so thank you both um we got a lot of questions in um a few uh specific ones uh, regarding the um the talks and i think we can start with those maybe um one question for ronit is from ben Yang, who is asking so um antibodies would be mostly made by b cells in the lymph nodes. How do these antibodies uh, then, how could they cross then uh, lung epithelial cell barriers um, to get to the epical side of the alveoli to neutralize incoming viruses? Well, as I said, the antibodies are only one form of the activity. This is more the humoral activity. And we see them crossing, whether it is uh, because of the High vascular hyperpermeability that is common in, in, in this uh, uh, very immunogenic uh, uh, disease. Uh, and the other is the cellular immunity. So I think both are combined. We do see them uh, reaching uh, the sites. Uh, I think that the more important thing will be what will be the uh, affinity of those antibodies. And as I mentioned, there are the common antibodies that are formed, but more important, or at least equally important, it seems, especially in the vulnerable uh, older uh, population, is those high affinity antibodies that are uh, induced from the uh, germinal centers where we see the uh, T follicular helper cells that uh, are activating and uh, triggering the production of those high affinity antibodies. So in this case, we will need less antibody to cross and reach the, the lung, uh, but they will be way more active. Yeah, yeah, thank you. Now we have here a question for Nicole um, uh, from Kershid Cooper. Um, how does the microneedle patch work? So, yes, yeah, so th thank you, Kershid, uh, for, for this question. So, the microneedle patch, um, so it's uh, essentially injection molded, and we have the VLPs and this PLGA matrix. And th the way this will be designed as that um, upon contact, so after you apply your microneedle patch on your skin somewhere, the needles will be quickly released into the skin. And uh, so that's a quick release, so the needles will be in the skin, you won't, you won't feel them. And then over time, over about a month, the VLPs will be more slowly released from the PLGA matrix. So rather than using the traditional vaccination scheme where you get a prime and then two weeks later a boost and maybe another two weeks later another boost, the slow release 
will mimic um, this prime boost scheme and therefore allow just a single administration to be effective. Wonderful. I think that feeds a bit in at another question we got from Piravin Bartasarati. I apologize probably for my awful pronunciation, um, who's asking, uh, how can nanotechnology actually contribute to COVID-19 research and vaccine development in developing countries where resources are scarce? Yeah, maybe I can start um, start on this because I sort of t t touched on this also in the talk. So I think nanotechnology and um, advanced uh, manufacturing can greatly contribute in in areas where resources are are, are scarce. So it, just to t to say a few more words about molecular farming. So this relate it's not necessarily a nanotechnology, but it can be used to produce nanotechnologies. While it's still a relatively novel technology, it's mature and it has great potential in low-resource countries. And I want to um, give an example where molecular farming has already made an appearance, and that was during the 2014 or 15 uh, Ebola pan, um, epidemic, uh, where ZMAP was produced, and that was an antibody cocktail produced by KVP, Kentucky Bioprocessing, it, uh, produced through molecular farming and plants, and that was used to treat Ebola patients. I think over the last few years, governments in several low-income um, countries have already invested in setting up plant molecular farming facilities. So Cape Biofarms is one faci facility in South Africa, but there's also facilities being um, built in Thailand as well as in Brazil. There, there may be other countries as well. Um, opportunity also exists that biopharmaceuticals could be produced in edible plant tissue. Uh, so Protelix is an example of a company that produced uh, pharmaceuticals in uh, carrot cells. Um, but be beyond the molecular farming, I think nanomanufacture of slow release patches, of microneedle patches, or any nanotechnology that could be that could stabilize a vaccine so that we can ship it around the world without the cold chain would already make an impact. Great, thank, thank you so much. Um, for Ronit, a question from Cassandra Kalman. How did you choose which peptide sequences from the S protein to use as epitopes in your vaccine? Okay, so we used a, a bioinformatic approach that, that, that is a bit complicated to, to describe here, but I, I can tell you the criteria which we uh, went by. So the first one was to look really at similarities. As, as I said, there is a, a 85, 87% homology between the SARS-CoV-1 and the SARS-CoV-2. So we know already from the data, the accumulating data for, for several uh, good years, which peptides in a T cell assay were able to, to uh, activate T cells. And uh, we know also which ones were able to uh, expand the B cells and produce antibodies of many forms. So this could give a, a, a first hint to, to where to go in, the, in those areas. Then we can feed them to the ones that maybe have a one, two amino acids different in the SARS-CoV-2, but it gives us a strong confidence that this will work out. And indeed, these are some that we started with that are were really uh, uh, just uh, uh, as a good starting point, we saw that they already raised antibodies against, uh, for example, the RBD of the spike. But as I said, the more we learn about it, we see that there is potential for other regions in the, in the spike protein and other proteins there. Uh, we know that also hydrophobicity plays a role here. The more hydrophobic, the more immunogenic the peptide is. So it raises more, uh, uh, it activates more the T cells, B cells, and, and we see more uh, antibody production. So we, we had to also think about whether we want the, as the cellular immunity is, is really important in this case, beyond the, the regular antibodies that we look for from the humoral activity. It is also important to see uh, whether these are uh, T cell, B cell epitopes, MHC1 and MHC2 together. So there are so many criteria to, to give to the algorithms that we are uh, then testing and then getting out the, the peptide sequences of interest. And on top of that, even once we have selected them, there is a lot of try and error. We, we already have 14 different combinations 
uh, in each one two different sequences for MAT1 and MAT2, and we, we can see every time we're improving. So uh, I, I think that the best vaccine is yet to come for, for all of us. I assume for Nicole it's the same, as she was showing several uh, combinations. Yes, uh, great. Uh, Nicole, um, from Sikau Lu, can we synthesize an artificial virus mimicking the SARS coronavirus 2 to study COVID-19? Uh, yeah, it's, I think that's a, a great, uh, great question. Um, I think principally the answer is yes. Um, I, I think this falls into the area of uh, physical virology where chemists and physicists, computational scientists sort of uh, interface. Um, it, it, it's a field that has been, um, that, that was born maybe 10, 20 years ago. And it allows us to yeah, build model systems, so build a simplified version of an infectious virus to, to study assembly. And ultimately, when we gain fundamental insights into viral assembly, we can also gain um, insights into or lay the foundation for drug discovery. I think it's a field that um, will greatly benefit from close collaboration with computational scientists as well to, to lay a foundation for predictive models um, right, right now it's COVID-19, but we, we need to establish a readiness for, uh, for the next uh, mutant or the next strain to arise. Yeah, great. Um, I think we're getting towards the end, but I want to go through two questions that I think lots of people have been also submitting and would be great to get your opinion on this. Um, so one thing is we've talked about M M D RNA and DNA vaccines that are in clinical trials now, but as a matter of fact, non there is no RNA or DNA vaccine against any disease, actually, in the clinic. Um, so what do you think are the biggest hurdles there? And, and where, is, where is going to be the biggest contribution there for of nanotechnology? Where, where can we come in as a field now? I don't know. Ronnie, do you want to start? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So, so first, I, I would like to, to... First, you're right. However, there, are, there have been recently two SIRNA, uh, not vaccines, but two SIRNA uh, uh, compounds coming from al nylon, the patisiran and the givoseran. So both of them are, are not for COVID-19 nor uh, for, for cancer, but it means that they're, they're potentially there and the applicability is there. So it is possible to, to go through all the uh, steps up to approval by the FDA. Um, as, as for vaccine and, and for any other, for that matter, RNA, DNA, all the oligonucleotides, there are a lot of challenges there. So the promise of RNA interference with the Nobel Prize and everything around it actually didn't come to fruition yet. I think uh, we, we have to overcome a lot of hurdles like uh, the uh, stability in the blood. As I said, there are 10 to, as, as the oligonucleotides, there is a high risk of degradability while in circulation. They are negatively charged molecules, so they are not even if you manage to inject them intracellularly or inter locally, you will not manage to get it to cross the membrane, the cellular membrane, as a negatively charged molecule. So uh, this is, an, and there is a clear, a rapid clearance by the respiratory endothelial system, the RES, and clearance generally. So there are a lot of uh, uh, different, including an effect, a side effect of a. Uh, um, with the complement, uh, raising the complement activation. And this, I think, is where nanotechnology can contribute. We saw it also with uh, al nylon, the two SARNAs, but also uh, in, in a lot of uh, laboratories and uh, biotech companies working on the delivery of those, as now we see with the DNA and the RNA, they're all using either lipid nanoparticles or polymeric nanoparticles, that they tend to, to first package them they have the ability to um, uh, create a polyplex or a, a lipoplex that is by a positively charged together with the negatively charged oligonucleotide. So we have a very stable uh, complex that is able to survive and not be not have those uh, adverse effects that are associated with positively charged molecules. And and they think this is where uh, nanotechnology can really. Um, advance this field of, of vaccination. Also for peptides that uh, do not have it's uh, 10 or 15 amino acids, but peptides do not have, they, are, they have poor drug-like properties. They, they also are not stable. So 
we see there that all these nanoparticles can really stabilize and make sure that they are targeted to the right site at the right time. Mm. Uh, uh, absolutely. And um, for Nicole, you mentioned platform the importance of a platform technology. And I think this is a little bit what we're feeling right now because now we need something very fast. However, we do not have, we're not as advanced with the platform technologies as we may want to be. So do you think there was a bit of a lack of in investment uh, scientifically over the last years in vaccines or in platform technologies, um, which would potentially, if we would have that, would speed this up now a little bit? Um, yeah, th yeah, thank you for, for the question. And um, yeah, I think the, so the short answer is yes. Um, I do think there was a, a lack of um, funding and support to develop platform technologies. Um, so coming from an academic point of view, right, in my experience, you can't get past a study section with a grant that's not disease focused. And of course, we need to do research that's clinically relevant and disease focused. But I think this uh, COVID-19 pandemic highlights we weren't ready. And I think there's a need um, for, for funding agencies, for stakeholders, for investors to, to realize we need to build platform technologies for readiness. Um, so we need to invest in um, universal vaccine, universal delivery platforms, um, adjuvants, and um, downstream manufacturing pipelines that we can be ready um, the next time. And I think what we're seeing now is this, like the, it's amazing to see all these parallel efforts, right? There's uh, from academic labs to industry, small and large pharma, more than 150 different vaccines have been reported at all various stages, right? Vaccine candidates. Mm -hmm. But in all these examples, you see a repurposing of, uh, of technology. Right, Ronit is repurposing her cancer vaccine. I'm repurposing my CPMV. Moderna wasn't working on, on COVID-19, right? They're repurposing what they're developing. So can we get from repurposing technology to readiness of technology? Mm -hmm. And, and I, I do think this um, may be an eye opener and an opportunity here to, to change, uh, change the way of thinking and um, enable funding of uh, development of platform technologies. Yeah, great. I think that brings me, I think, to the last point um, that I would like to discuss with you to get your opinion on is, as you know, especially in the drug delivery field, nanotechnology has suffered some criticism, some drawbacks sometimes because of uh, not everything getting into the clinic as we have hoped for. Ronit was covering this a little bit and said there are actually now things in the clinic with the nanoparticles. So do you think that the fact that everything is so fast tracked right now? And, and as Ronit mentioned, unprecedented the timings, right? I mean, we are, we are fast-tracking vaccine development. Do you think this is going to have a very positive impact on our field, on the nanotechnology field in general, also for not COVID-19 related topics? I don't know, uh, Ronit, do you want to go first and then yeah, comment? Absolutely. I, I think uh, first, uh, if I follow on uh, what Nicole mentioned, if we put aside, I mean, everybody agrees that this is devastating times in terms of uh, society, health, financial, economical, and so on. But if we put that, those aside, uh, in terms of science and translation, bridging the gap between academia and, and industry, I think this is a fascinating era and, and, and we should really embrace it and take the opportunity because we see that many things that we've been doing for so long and that raised so much uh, um, rejection because of the complexity of nanotechnology. We have to remember, this is not a small molecule that you have a clear HPLC peak that you can synthesize, have it reproduced, and it's very simple. These are more complex, but as you can see, the, those simple molecules rarely can, can help in, in such a pandemic. And I think if we were smarter before all of us, and get in on being ready. And I think even in Tel Aviv University, we have now a new center for pandemics that was raised, a new BSL-3. So everybody is becoming more ready. Imagine if we had all these platforms scalable with the, all the CMC, the safety, the, everything around it that was just on the shelf to come and put in the, the peptide or the RNA or the DNA just to plug and play. This would have been even way faster and, and at the moment if the fastest uh, vaccine was for Ebola or measles uh, that took about five years in record time 
we could have, have shortened it significantly. So I think we all learned from it a lot as well. Thank you, Nicole. Yeah, yeah, I will. Um, I, yeah, I fully agree. I will just add on that. Yeah, I agree. There's, um, I think, a huge opportunity here for us to also learn that there's a lot of novel technologies that haven't been licensed or approved in the clinic yet, and several have not even been in clinical trials yet. Uh, however, with uh, with this urgency, a lot of these new technologies are now entering clinical trials. A lot of researchers are repurposing their technologies towards infectious disease. So there's going to be a massive amount of data, and not just research data, but clinical data. So we can learn from this. Like this, like it, it will largely depend also on whether industry will make uh, clinical trial data available. Right? Usually we hear about the successes, not the failures. But but I think what I see right now in the scientific community is this altruistic data sharing. Right? Everybody is um, sharing the data as rapidly as they can through various platforms. And, and I hope to see that, that same altruistic uh, data sharing from industry, because we have an opportunity here to, to learn from the successes, but also the, um, the failures. I, I can add that beyond the data sharing, we see a lot of material sharing. We, we see an open platform. Uh, everybody is talking to everyone uh, across the globe, not only locally. And, and uh, it, it yielded about 23,000 papers in the field, and 5,000 of them are on as preprints, which we usually do not share so fast. You can see it on BioArchive and MedArchive. So, so I, I just hope that the day after this pandemic, we will keep this in mind and continue in this way, because this is how we can advance science and its translation much faster. Wonderful. I think I think these were fantastic uh, words to to finish our discussion. Thank you both so much for joining. I really appreciate it. I think it was super informative, and it was great to see the first data on your or vaccine research. I hope everybody who joined us from all over the globe um, enjoyed it as well. Um, stay safe, everybody. Take care, everybody, and um, see you all when we are back to not normal. Bye bye. Bye. Thank you. Thank you.